Welcome to the Futurati Podcast. Any member of the Futurati is somebody who believes in the power of the future. We know there's a better world ahead, and we indeed have the power to make it so. In our podcast, we talk to the best minds in the world about the most urgent problems facing mankind today, and we hope you learn as much from them as we do. I'm Thomas Fry, a professional futurist and keynote speaker. And I'm Trent Fowler, a machine learning engineer and author. Thank you for joining us. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for listening to the Futurati Podcast. Tonight, we're joined by Samu Buria. Samu is a sociologist and the founder of Bismarck Analysis, a firm that analyzes institutions from governments to companies. His research work focuses on the causes of societal decay and flourishing, and he writes on history, epistemology, and strategy. If you enjoy this interview, please don't forget to like the episode and subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to check out our website, futuratipodcast.com. Samo, thanks so much for being on the show. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Can we hear a little bit about your background, your interests, and what brought you to working on the problems that you're working on? Um, you know, I'm the founder of a company called Bismarck Analysis. It is a political risk consulting firm. Uh, it specializes in, you know, understanding the uh, political and institutional landscapes of society. And uh, often our clients find great value in being able to understand the fundamentals driving political events, right? There's both economic value and philanthropic value in that. Uh, our clients are typically uh, ultra high net worth individuals. Sometimes we've also provided reports for governments. Uh, for listeners out there, we do have a more uh, democratic product called the Bismarck Brief. It is an in-depth weekly brief where uh, you will get to read a deep case study into one of the fundamental institutional forces uh, driving the world. Through the course of a year, uh, you'll end up covering everything that is uh, of a uh, supreme strategic importance, let's say, everything at the, not the 10,000 feet level, but let's say the 2,000 feet level, right? So you wouldn't be surprised by the recent events in Ukraine had you been re reading our briefs. And you can find these briefs at brief dot Bismarck with a CK. So Bismarck analysis.com. I love it. Yeah. So since you brought up Ukraine, let's, uh, let's talk about what's on everybody's mind these days. I've listened to a couple of your interviews recently and normally I don't like to do this, but I'm afraid I'm going to have to start at kind of a prosaic point. The, I'm sure it's a question you've gotten many, many different times, but it's one that I've been struggling with and nobody seems to have a lot of clarity on. And that is specifically what Putin's motives are for having invaded the Ukraine. So you've got, uh, people like John Mearsheimer who think that it's entirely a result of Putin. Putin's fears about NATO expansion. And then you have other people who think that, no, Putin is trying to establish a 17th century style Russian empire. And he's he's mostly just an opportunist who saw a, a chance to, to strike while the iron was hot. Where do you come down on that? I think Putin believes it's its personal mission to rebuild the Russian state after the humiliation of the 1990s. Uh, I think almost everything in his career can be understood as this. People can describe him as tactically an opportunist, but I do believe there is a clear long-term strategy. Even when it comes to this military operation, and its success can be debated, uh, in particular because of uh, the brave resistance of Ukrainians to the invasion, the groundwork for it was, was laid years in advance, right? Uh, let's remember what a novel and innovative move the annexation of Crimea was in 2014. It was a previously unseen hybrid operation where uh, you know you basically disarm, defeat, surprise the enemy side. They sort of surrender without a fight. You carry out a fake referendum. The little place declares independence, and then you know it completely coincidentally joins the Russian Federation a few days later. Right. The Western world had no solid response to that at all. And note, it worked out for him. Right. There was no insurgency in Crimea because in the political climate of 2014, you know, not everyone in Crimea was opposed to being part of Russia, not saying it's morally justified. But I think probably the majority of the population preferred at the time to be part of the Russian Federation than Ukraine. 2021 is not 2014, but this has been long coming. Right. These are decades long trends, things like reform of the military, 
things like concerns about NATO expansion, things like a rehabilitation of the Russian imperial tradition and a reconception of the very basis of Russian state legitimacy. The key project that I think he is trying to complete within his lifetime, ideally, is a truly sovereign and politically independent state. And this is a radical proposal, maybe an 18th century or a 19th century proposal, because Western states today, they're not really sovereign, right? They're deeply interdependent with each other. So depending on how you slice the world today, you know, China has political autonomy, has a political system that's not integrated with the West. And I think Russia for the longest time, it really wasn't clear whether it would just become another Western country. And I think this has been really the moment where uh, Russia will set on a very different course. I would say that from Putin's perspective, cutting cultural economic ties with the West might even be a feature, not a bug of this long-term historic perspective where he wants Russia to go down a different path than what was say taken by uh, Poland or by the Baltic states or by other Eastern European countries that have at this point significantly culturally, politically, and economically integrated into the Western world. So it sounds like he's trying to establish a uh almost entirely self-sufficient. Oh, he's trying to burn bridges is what I'm saying. It's not just about self-sufficiency, right? He's trying to burn bridges so that his successors, even if they wanted to, could not just fold, no matter how tantalizing the economic incentives are. So perhaps the correct uh, analogy here would be with the uh, state of Iran. Arguably, the leadership of the Islamic Republic of Iran has for decades tried to normalize itself and tried to reopen trade with the Western world and try to come with sorts, some sort of accommodation. But the conservative elements in their own government, right, such as uh, the democratically elected presidents, unlike the Guardian Council, they've trended in a more uh, conservative direction. And also there's just so much bad blood that Iran can't just become a normal country. So uh, my proposal here is maybe Putin wanted to make sure that no matter who succeeds him, Russia cannot become just a normal country. So I realize I'm asking you to psychologize a little bit here and get into the mind of a person who hasn't been very forthcoming with with uh, much of this, many of his motivations. But why do you think he might be wanting to do that? Like, what are the advantages of being uh, of trying to be so self-sufficient that you're burning the bridges such that successors couldn't turn around, even if it wound up being a bad idea? Like, what do, what do you think he's trying to get out of that? Well, I, I don't even think we need to psychologize. I think we can just go and uh, examine the official documents of the current Russian state and the political objectives it has. The very conception of so-called sovereign democracy proposes that Russia needs an independent media space, right? Uh, recently, we've, of course, also began to ban Russian uh, disinformation campaigns. So, you know, I think uh, Russia today and these other outlets will find it harder and harder to spread uh, articles and their perspectives and so on on our social media. Russia is uh, in the process of setting up its own great firewall comparable to China as well. So that's the first step. There's a media divorce. Uh, the media divorce is because from Putin's perspective, the West has been bombarding with Russia, has been bombarding Russia with misinformation campaigns for decades, right? Uh, from his perspective, capital has left Russia for places like London, right? With many Russian billionaires deciding to settle in uh, London rather than Russia itself, taking their, you know, sort of financial interests, right? Their financial interests becoming dispersed from the country. So anyway, the um, political security that he seeks for Russia is the kind of political security the United States has by virtue of geography. The US doesn't have to make sovereignty it's a uh, you know, overarching mission. It has two giant oceans securing its geopolitical integrity. There's no force in the world, not even China, that could successfully carry out any sort of conventional action uh, on, on the American continent. There's just no way. It would be so much worse than even D-Day 80 years ago. It's completely impossible, completely fantastical. Meanwhile, for Russia, it's not inconceivable at all that in this very, very long stretches of border, someone supports separatist movements. And note, there is evidence that Western governments supported separatist movements within Russia. So this is not completely paranoid. 
uh, there was uh, weapons and training delivered to Chechen fighters in the 1990s. And it's good to remember that Putin started his career with concluding the Chechen war, defeating a uh, very serious insurgency in a very brutal manner, right? Not to, you know, not to justify the means, but I think he's been on this mission to at all costs preserve the territorial integrity of Russia. And the key disagreement between, say, Putin and Western leaders is, I don't think Western leaders think like this anymore. Uh, I don't think they really believe in, uh, you know, reasons of state. I think they sort of have a vague notion that uh, they're building a global system of governance and they just happen to be attached to a particular country. There's no real idea that there's a deep history uh, tied to a particular place, that there's a multi-generational political strategy that's at play, that they should perhaps you know, think of uh, what their predecessors thought of in the 1960s, 1920s, 1820s on geopolitics and continue whatever game uh, was set up long ago. What do you think is driving that difference? As you were describing it, I was thinking that in the United States, we're fairly young and mm -hmm. th there's not the same kind of deep history because it was all pilgrims and immigrants that settled the country. Whereas that's not the case with Russia. It goes back thousands of years. But I don't think that's as true for, you know, Western Europe or some of the other countries that are under the umbrella, the the uh, penumbra of American influence. So what is it? It's uh, mm -hmm. no, that, that's fine. Just go ahead. I was just going to say it is somewhat true of one Western European country, uh, that's France. France does maintain a neocolonial sphere of influence in West Africa. It's not often discussed, but uh, they are also the most prolific of Western European countries when it comes to military interventions. Now for say Germany, I think uh, in the 20th century, they want to make a clean break with their own past. Mm -hmm. In the second half of the 20th century, you could see as a correction for the first half. So their experiences with militarism, with totalitarianism, with nationalism, have led them as far away from that as possible. Their overarching priority is a kind of like technocratic stability. So that I'm talking even at the elite level. So I'm not even talking about the opinions of ordinary Germans, but if you look at a statesman like Adenauer after World War II, the slogan was literally no experiments, right? All the experiments were considered to have failed. Uh, communism, Nazism, all of that uh, was supposed to be put aside, right? And to a significant degree, I think the smaller European countries simply don't have the size to be historically relevant. There's no reason really to dedicate your life uh, to making Lithuania a great powerful state. <laughs> there are reasons to dedicate your life to making it a good place to live for Lithuanians. But that's a very different motivation if you think about it. It doesn't, it doesn't stir the same emotion. It doesn't stir the same set of human motivations and it doesn't inspire the same actions. I think that dovetails well with something you said earlier about Putin's long-term project being in part a matter of trying to reconceptualize the foundations of the Russian state. So is it fair to say that in the West, more generally with the exception you know, of Russia and maybe a couple of other states, we have this idea that there's a social contract between the citizens and the government and that that's sort of the foundation, the legality, the fountainhead of, of the legitimacy of the state. What do you think is Putin's understanding of that? What is he trying to rebuild there? I basically think that in basically the absence of Marxist-Leninist ideology, which was completely discredited in the former Soviet Union circa 1991, 1990s, right? Uh, there's still, of course, an occasional communist uh, party here and there. By the way, you might not know that in the Russian Duma, that is the Russian parliament, it's the Communist Party that's the only real opposition party. It's, of course, completely marginalized, right, at right. only a few percentage points. But they sometimes vote differently than United Russia, uh, which is uh, Vladimir Putin's party, right? So, in fact, interestingly, right, the communists were so discredited, they were so outside the political spectrum that right now they're actually a little bit of an independent force uh, within Russian politics. Interesting. Now, having having gone down that small tangent, right, and I do think we have to discuss Russia's political system and the way it functions to some extent, um, I think the, the mandate remains popular sovereignty, 
So the view is, it's not that it's quite a social contract. It is that it basically, the will, the will of the people matters, but it's something like the destiny of the people matters more. There is a nation, it is the Russian nation, and he probably will try to redefine it if successful in Ukraine to be basically Russians and Belarusians and Ukrainians. They're all basically this greater Russian thing, right? The same way that uh, in China, if you speak Cantonese, you are still considered Han Chinese, right? Even though that's a different language than Mandarin and so on. Um, I think that in this reconceptualized notion, Russia has a unique historical destiny it's defined by a few cultural traits like orthodoxy. Uh, orthodoxy has probably been picked up due to political reasons, has in fact been revived to a significant extent within Russia and to a lesser extent, uh, some, other, some other parts of Europe. Uh, I think the view is going to be that, look, Russians have had a terrible history, always invaded by foreign opponents. And this is why Russians have to be strong in their defense of their own interests. And uh, you know, there's an interesting way in which NATO aggression plays on the same strings as the aggression of World War II. They frame the expansion of NATO as yet another Western invader. You know, Hitler and Napoleon, and then the Americans. And there's a certain like logic to it, right? It gives you this place in the world, and then the legitimacy of the Russian state is judged whether it maintains territorial integrity, which mind you is sort of similar to the Chinese notion that, you know, the uh, one China, right? The one China policy that the Chinese state cannot be allowed to fragment uh, because otherwise this would be disastrous for the Chinese nation. The same is true. Uh, the same is true in Russia. The view is that, you know, 1991 was a geopolitical disaster, though the end of communism was good. The fragmentation of the Soviet Union was bad. So do you think he's trying to expand the borders out to where the former Soviet Union was? Or is he going to settle for maybe parts of Ukraine and maybe a bit of Belarus and a few holdings here and there? I think this is a, a matter then not of intention, but of political constraints, right? And uh, how how much of your intention you bring to reality uh, is, is always, it's always uh, greatly moderated by events. Even if he wanted to restore the Soviet Union. That's just not possible, right? The Russian Empire simply cannot be pieced back together uh, to go even before the Bolshevik Revolution. What can be done, however, and I, I think is sort of the Russian victory scenario, which is still a very grim scenario. Uh, it's one where over the next 20 to 40 days, Ukraine is conquered and a uh, puppet government is set up based in Kiev many territories in the east of Ukraine are formally annexed into Russia. But the Kiev uh, state, the new Kiev state, joins the so-called union state. The union state is an entity, a legal entity that exists that technically unifies Belarus and Russia into a single state. This has existed on paper since the late 1990s but it's been sometimes more of a reality, other times less. I think it's becoming more of a reality with this war. In particular, just a few days ago, Belarus, uh, you know, as of the recording of this podcast, Belarus allowed strategic nuclear weapons to be positioned in its territory. Oh, I didn't I know that. That's, that's a significant change, right? In other words, they're allowing not only Russians to invade Ukraine from Belarus, they're by allowing the positioning not just of Russian troops in Belarus, but the positioning of Russian nuclear weapons in Belarus. Now, of course, you can still frame this as two independent countries. At the end of the day, there are American nuclear weapons in Italy, in Germany, in Britain, in Turkey even, until they were pulled out. However, I think what's happening is inching step and step closer towards, well, once the war in Ukraine is done, we will declare the new Kiev government as part of the union state of Russia, Belarus, and Russia. Maybe they'll rename it to something more charismatic than the union state. Right, right. Uh, but I think this will be the new political entity, and it's going to be much closer than NATO or the European Union. I think it will be a, a fairly centralized, Moscow-centered state. And, uh, you know, I think 
Belarus and Ukraine might preserve some internal autonomy, the same way the Chechen Republic, which is a component republic of the Russian Federation, the current Russian state, there might be internal autonomy preserved and a local strongman backed. So in fact, I expect the current uh, dictator of Belarus to remain dictator de facto, just not externally independent. And uh, who knows who they're going to bring in to govern the rest of Ukraine. So in that scenario, that's pretty close to a restored Soviet Union. The only missing variable is, uh, you know, two missing variables, the Baltic states, uh, which I don't think there's any realistic scenario he could get, and Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan might be pressured or even invaded in the coming years to join the union state. But I think that's a, uh, that it really is stretching the, the limits of possibility. So even if you got Kazakhstan, which maybe could happen, uh, this is still a vastly weaker state than the Soviet Union is. It would be a great power, but not truly a superpower. So it would become a strong regional power, very dependent on China economically. What do you think the prospects of that project are long term? I'm thinking of the the first glimmers of Christendom when when Charlemagne took the throne in in France and established the uh, Frankish Empire, which then dissolved about one generation after he died, or the fate of the Habsburg Empire, which is something I've learned a lot about in recent years, and it, it's kind of remarkable to me that Spain and, and the Holy Roman Empire unified and controlled this gigantic bit of territory, but they just couldn't hold it together. There were too many autonomous centers of power. There were local invasions that forced these uh, city states to furnish their own defenses, which weakened their loyalty to the crown that was very far away and not handling things very well. Do you think that the union state, were it to include Kazakhstan, has any realistic prospect of surviving? You said that it, it could be a, a great power, but not a superpower. I think it basically would have a realistic prospect of surviving if succession was solved for the component republics. That is, if after the current dictator of Belarus retires or dies of natural causes, who runs Belarus? And are they interested in becoming an independent sovereign state once more? Go for a Belarus exit, right? right. Um, I think as long as the political incentives of local elites remain aligned with the incentives of Moscow, there's no reason to break away. Note, uh, the Chechen Republic today is one of Putin's power bases. Yet he started his political career with brutally suppressing an independence movement there, bombing out Grozny in this uh, you know, very Russian style of war that's very artillery based. You don't fight over a city block, you level a city block, and then you move to the next city block until you're done and no insurgency, right? You're done um, at a terrible cost, of course. Uh, the key thing that happened there was, uh, you know, Putin empowered, again, a local strongman. This strongman purged all fighting forces, spent 15 years building a strong, fanatical, dedicated, loyal fighting force. And this fighting force is basically free of any interference from the rest of the Russian Federation. They can move about with impunity, arresting people, executing people, so on. And this is politically useful to Putin or whoever his successor is because it is a balance against the power internally within Russia of say Russia's generals or other members of the intelligence community or even particular oligarchs. So there's a very interesting way in which, you know, maybe this even stabilizes Russia. I think Kiev is always going to be independent minded, but Belarus, I think Belarus could be absorbed into the Russian state long-term and actually I think the same might be true of Kazakhstan, which despite all the difficulties and the by now unique national identity is uh, still demographically much smaller than Russia. And the bulk of its population actually lives along the border with the Russian Federation. That's fascinating. I want to go back to something you mentioned earlier about autarkies, and you cited a couple of examples, Russia becoming one, Iran becoming one, China becoming one. Do you think this is a trend that's going to continue? And what is it that's driving that development? Is it just a rebellion against Western hegemony? Is it just some other factor? I, I, not, I don't really have purchase on it. 
I think Iran is too small to truly be an autonomous region, right? So I think there is a natural drive right now away from globalization, but not towards nationalism. It's actually towards sort of regional economic and political constructs. When people talk about the EU as a potentially interesting entity, they're actually completely right. The economic integration on the scale of the continent really does make sense. China is an exception because it's so vast, right? It's so vast that it might as well be a continent. It certainly has nearly twice as many people as all of Europe, right? Europe, all of Europe, even if we count the Russian part of Europe, is 700 million people. Russia is, uh, you know, let's say 140 million people of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you look at China, China is there at 1.3 billion people maybe 1.5, depending on how many illegal births happened, because of, of course, during the one child policy, you were incentivized to hide a birth, right? You weren't incentivized to uh, make sure all your kids had a social security number. If the, every social security number meant a revocation of privileges for your existing children, or even for you personally. So it's a little bit unclear what exactly China's population is, but you know, about twice the size that's pretty accurate. It has vast territories in the west of China um, that it's stabilized. Uh, Energy-wise, it is not independent. So I think global trade blocks, these sort of trade blocks that are continent scale are almost inevitable. But even these trade blocks will not be autarkies. What they however are, and I think this is a natural evolution as American hegemony recedes, uh, they will be strategically independent. They'll have their own military forces. Arguably, you know, of two days ago, Germany announced it is spending an extra 100 billion euros on a military, right? That right. is a significant investment for Germany. And this is, of course, bad for Russia, especially in the long term. But just because it's bad for Russia doesn't actually mean it's good for America. A Germany, a Germany that has a strong enough military to act independently is a Germany that will act politically and militarily independently. America's had a troubled relation with the one Western European country capable of independent military action, that is France. France even withdrew from NATO command structures in the 1960s. And France, of course, pursues wars independently of US interest in places like uh, you know, Libya or West Africa. There, of course, um, will remain significant common interests between Europe and the United States. But let's not mince words. If Europe ever achieves the so, des so desired strategic autonomy that European leaders talk about, it will eventually lead to a divergence of interest between the United States and Europe. Right now, Europe's small militaries are only useful in concert with America's military. If they become useful on their own, they will be used. I think this is just, it's kind of one of these political laws of history, no matter how falsely pacifist the Europeans believe themselves to be because of values. The majority of uh, European peace, I think, can be attributed just to uh, US military hegemony. Uh, so I worry that the world of regions is a less peaceful world where uh, these large economic blocks that are still not resource self-sufficient because in the modern era, it's almost impossible to be resource self-sufficient, almost no matter who you are. Uh, with their own independent military capacity will start to intervene in weaker countries on their own accord and uh you know global governance that never really took off that never really took off uh say the u.n security council is uh famously indecisive right uh you know that will be replaced by sort of a more regional let's call it an anarchy of blocks right so it's not that any country will be able to do what it wants but a big enough block will mostly on internal political calculations be able to kind of do what it wants insofar as the power of other blocks permits it. I'm trying to figure out what it is that would drive the development of supranational regional economic blocks as the basic political unit on earth. And the two that come to mind are a receding power on the part of the United States, and also the fact that military technology today is so powerful that it, it really doesn't make a lot of sense for a single country to stand alone. You, you have to have a certain amount, like certain numbers 
to to bolster your ranks in order to stand any reasonable chance or or, or sometimes just geography right a hypersonic missile can co- can fly from modern day ukraine to moscow in a time that is too short for someone to even have a conversation with the russian president to explain that a nato missile is flying their way now of course this is the scenario russians say they're afraid of but it goes the other way as well uh you know remember the cuban missile crisis right it was unacceptable to have soviet missiles and these were not even hypersonic missiles these were just ballistic missiles right. in cuba because it cuts down on decision making time and you know government is slow government does not move very fast even in times of war decisions take days not hours not minutes um so i think that you know a lot of it is the speed of warfare has increased you know air power it generally is a globalizing force there's also um outside of warfare there's a reality that energy is a regional consideration no matter how clever we are there's no way to export electricity from germany to australia or from australia to germany we can maybe export fossil fuels maybe export uranium but that's quite different right if you're mining uranium from australia or from south africa and shipping it to germany let's say optimistically germany reopens its nuclear reactors well you've produced a dependency right a resource dependency and it's one way uh south africa or australia could sell their uranium to china and in fact australia i think uh considered this quite recently uh so really energy except for oil is a regional resource right there are a few places that have it it's hard to move around uh there's a reason people still burn german coal even though you could probably ship in coal from china uh oil has been sort of the perfect energy reserve because you could ship it you could put it literally on a boat and sail it to the other end of the world right. and it would not be that expensive even natural gas has to usually be delivered right now through pipelines that's one of the reasons that through all of this madness of this war and all of the escalating uh and probably justified sanctions from the west versus russia germany continues to buy russian gas because they have no choice so that's sort of like an energy fundamental that is pushing in russia's favor and uh i think i think a lot of these uh decisions that might seem like perhaps military or nationalistic decisions are sometimes energy decisions. So the economics of energy is a big part of what will drive the world towards these regional power blocks as against nations and as against something global such as the UN. Exactly, right? There's no there's no global energy grid. I mean, one of the interesting ideas uh, that I've always wondered is what is what kind of energy breakthrough is actually globalizing? For example, most of green energy is localizing right you 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 uh build solar cells and windmills wherever you find them okay that's not a globalizing force uh fusion oh that's also not a globalizing force and when i was thinking this through i realized the single technology that would push towards a single world of energy the most would be cheap room temperature superconductors now of course these would have many other applications but the fun part is they would actually enable a truly global energy grid. Well, that's really interesting. I'd never considered that. Do you want to take a stab at imagining what the different regional blocks will be? We've already mentioned possibly the European Union, China potentially on its own, although I think you could make the argument that it, s- some other Southeast Asian countries fall within its umbrella uh, and and might do more as the the years go on. What about in Africa? What about in the United States? Do you think it will still be America alone? I think the United States uh will probably do its best to preserve sort of uh its current network of alliances. So the US is going to continue to try to work with Australia, with Japan, with Canada, with Britain and with the European Union for as long as possible. Um I think that Ch- China and Russia it really depends right now as to how severe the economic damage against Russia is. If it's very severe, I think it does not result in Putin losing power. It results in Russia being completely dependent on China. 
If, however, the economic damage is less than it appears at the present moment, uh, I think Putin will continue to have the option of balancing India versus China. So this is interesting, right? Putin is not relying on the US to counterbalance China. He doesn't believe there's any good relation possible. I think the very fact that this invasion happened shows that uh, he has closed that opportunity. And by the way, that's a world away from the Putin of 2000, right? In 2000, when Putin met uh, US, the US president at the time, he raised the topic of, well, maybe Russia should enter NATO, right? We're, we're in a completely different planet Wow. 22 years later, completely different planet and a completely different political environment. And through his long career, he's seen this environment change. Still, India has been long suggested as a possible great power contender. If that were to happen, its natural sphere of influence would be that of a naval power, which actually aligns it significantly with British and American interests. It would project power through the Indian Ocean. It's not clear whether this will happen, I don't think there's strong evidence of Indian industrialization. You can probably already infer from this that I basically think all of these blocks are essentially industrial blocks. The global supply chain has been having a really rough time. Right. When Americans are talking of reshoring industry, right? Energy independence, security, uh, moving, you know, moving the uh, CPU chip fabs. Uh, back into the United States, that's not just America talking. China thinks like this too. G people in Germany are starting to think this way too. So if you reshore as much as you can, um, you know, in some ways the world becomes poorer, but in other ways, I think there's an opportunity for new centers of industry. I could imagine Turkey being, because of its unique geographic position and its solid industrial growth over the last 20 years, note that, for example, it is Turkish Bakhtar drones that are fighting on the Ukrainian side that are being used on the Ukrainian side versus Russia, and they're doing fairly well. Those are completely Turkish manufactured drones. That's high-tech weaponry, right? It's not just the United States that builds them. Um, basically, I think Turkey could reassemble something like a Middle Eastern sphere of influence, for example, right? And that would be a small regional power. I think Africa, the most promising part of Africa is actually East Africa. There's a project called the East African Federation, which would uh, include a number of countries such as Kenya and Rwanda and integrate a region that honestly has just too many landlocked countries who need better ports and infrastructure and would successfully connect them to the world's economy. But also it would end up being a country of like, uh, by the time it's done federating, something like 300 million people at current demographic projections. So I think the East African Federation uh, and you know, listeners can read about this project on, on Wikipedia or any of the many articles describing it, uh, a lot of the legal framework is already there. It's just not yet been followed up with political moves. So a lot of the treaties that would create this uh, entity have already been signed. Um, well, th that is the best candidate in Africa. So I, what I'm saying, in other words, is I think regional parts of Africa might unify, might become very important political and economic blocks. But I'm bearish on the African Union as a whole, because the African Union as a whole is trying to unite radically different countries. You know, the African Union is not like the European Union, right? The European Union starts with six countries, integrates them, expands step by step, adding a country at a time or several countries has happened in the early 2000s. The African Union just started with something, uh, I don't know, 50 odd members try to get 50 governments to agree on anything of substance, okay? Right. And these are really different governments. We're talking South Africa uh, versus Egypt, right? <laughs> Egypt, basically an Arab country, very dense population, pretty poor. South Africa, an ethnically diverse country with a troubled history of apartheid, with economic troubles, but still sort of, uh, you know, used to be part of the developed world. And then add to the mix, uh, places that you know speak french spanish uh swahili it's it's like it's so different right even west africa versus east africa are culturally very distinct and there's there's not even a religious or 
religious difference that much, right? Both East and West Africa have both Christianity, Islam present local religions, but culturally West Africa say has to deal with this deep and scarring and history of the transatlantic slave trade. And, uh, you know, East Africa is more integrated into the Indian Ocean uh, cultural trade uh, complex that developed over the last one and a half thousand years. That is fascinating. And I want to go back to something you said about potentially there being more industrial centers as a result of the developments we've been talking about. It sounds like what the world would get is less wealth because you're not maximizing comparative advantage to the extent possible, Mm -hmm. but you would get a little bit more resilience, right? More resilience and less inequality as well. In a very important sense, a whole a whole host of formerly third world countries would actually become middle income countries. That's right. Really- so imagine a world where there are more Mexico's or more Turkey's places that have some manufacturing and where GDP per capita goes up. Yeah. Um, it's, it's just very, very interesting. I, I want to spend some time talking about energy because it's been such a central point of this conversation and it's such an obvious, uh, fulcrum for the the geopolitical conflicts that are unfolding right now. And I wanted to get your opinion on the European reliance on Russian gas, right? So as a result of having decommissioned nuclear power plants, as a result of America primarily's push towards green energy, we now are somewhat hamstrung by the fact that Russia is this massive uh, natural gas and oil exporter and that we need those resources in order to, to fuel our economy. So do you think that the push towards green energy is uh, strategically a mistake? Do you think there are ways of doing it more safely? What are your What are your thoughts on just how that works? I think basically that Germany should supply its electricity from nuclear power. It really has no other choice of substance, uh, at least until there are new technologies developed. So fusion would actually be disrupted. But no matter how great the progress is in solar panels, and in fact, I'm extremely uh, bullish on photovoltaics. Uh, One of the Bismarck Brief reports details the development of progress in the photovoltaics industry, uh, which incidentally, of course, is centered in China, right? So the Chinese pursuing profit rather than ideals have done in a way more to uh, spread uh, you know, the uh, application of solar power than many decades of German green policy ever did. But that's that's a separate provocation. Um, I think no matter how good photovoltaics get, Germany remains a cloudy place. It gets about as much sunshine as Britain, okay? So Britain and Germany have to either do fossil fuels or nuclear power. There's no alternative. And if they're getting fossil fuels um, and they want to burn natural gas to supplement let's say, because it has a lower carbon footprint than coal, you know, so to supplement things like wind and so on, uh, you know, in that case, they're going to have to buy it from overseas at a much higher price than they've been buying it from Russia. And then a place where energy is expensive and labor is expensive, and that that is Germany, that's no place to build anything. So one of the questions I've been trying to wrap my head around is the extent and the reality of Russian power. So Russia enjoys a formidable reputation as a as a military power, and yet its progress in Ukraine has been rather underwhelming. I'm sure that's not purely due to uh, reasons of military power. Uh, and then also much has been made of the fact that Russia's GDP is relatively small. I, I've heard that it's something like the size of the state of Florida. And so it's it's really not an economic powerhouse either. But I was also reading a, uh, a thread that Ben Landau Taylor put out on Twitter the other day, basically saying, basically shrugging and saying, yeah, I mean, the GDP is not really there, but it doesn't have that much to do with military power. So how do you think about the confluence or the interaction rather between gross domestic product, between military power and how that plays out in a conflict like the one in Ukraine? When people say that Russia has a smaller GDP than Spain, I don't know why they consider this an argument against Russia rather than an argument against GDP as a useful measure. Um, there's that, that, a was, significant- that was exactly what I said, actually. I was like, yeah, p- people treat GDP as sacrosanct, but forget that it was developed in the 1930s by Simon Kuznets and is much more applicable to certain kinds of economies than the ones we see today. 
for, for example, it wouldn't be shocking to propose that the growth of Chinese GDP right now is closely correlated with the increase in material production. But would anyone be willing to bet that uh, American GDP growth has correlated closely with material production? Probably not. Probably there are some real information services, but also at the end of the day, there are things that increase GDP that make everyone poorer. Um, and you know, it's it's kind of interesting that people don't often consider about the possibility of economies that on paper have extremely high GDP, but actually are not that well off. I can give a concrete example. Please. Uh, in Ireland and Dublin especially, the GDP per capita is said to have eclipsed London. Yet if you go to Ireland and you go to London, you realize people in London are obviously richer and have a higher standard of living. So what's going on? What's happening is a large number of international corporations base themselves in Ireland due to a favorable tax treatment. Now, really, this on paper much higher gross domestic product results in some tax revenue for the Irish state. A tax revenue for the Irish state is quite different than actually wealthier than London economy on the ground. I don't want to diminish the prosperity of Ireland. Obviously, it's a first world country. It's had immense real economic progress, but that just shows why you can't compare GDP per capita per se. And you know, you can think of a place like New York, if you carved out New York and made it its own country, what would its GDP per capita be? And so on and so on. For example, um, if you calculate the Gini coefficient, which is the inequality coefficient, for any individual European country, it's low. But if you calculate the Gini coefficient for the European Union, which is supposed to be a single market, the Gini coefficient suddenly becomes comparable to that of the United States. And there are all these fun ways in which these numbers can be misleading. So, but to go back to the actual concrete question of Russia, well, Russia's GDP might be small, but a huge part of that GDP is the irreplaceable energy that they sell. I can get my call centers either from Russia or from India. In fact, India probably has better call centers. I can have my software written in Russia or Poland. I can have a high precision laser manufactured. Uh, actually, the Russians are the only ones that can manufacture those super well. But let's say I can have a drone, a military drone built either by Russia or by Turkey, and they would be about equally good. If I want cheap gas for Germany, there is only one place I can go, and that's Russia. Maybe in the future, Turkey will export more natural gas, and there'll be an extra pipeline built from Turkey, and maybe then Turkey competes. But then it's just two places in the world. It's like Turkey and Russia. So one way to think about it is that the leveraging and political position of an economy matters as much as its size does. Having said all of this, though, I want to make it clear that of the three great powers, Russia is by far the weakest, much weaker than the United States and China, economically, politically, and militarily. Fascinating. And at least within, within its own region, right? Within its own region. How do you go about trying to assess military and economic power? So I share your general distrust for these convenient metrics like GDP. I mean, I, th I think they have their place, but people rely on them as though it's a crystal ball that tells them everything they need to know. What, what do you look for in an economy to decide whether or not this actually has the potential to become a real power or if there's some funny business going on with overseas companies locating there, and that's causing the numbers to go up artificially. Well, I think one of the most important questions is, do the people live there? Well, again, <laughs> no, really, do, do the people that are engaged in the economic activity live in the relevant country? I know some of my colleagues were very optimistic about the, you know, an economy up in the cloud where we're all just talking over Zoom and no one ever has to go into a factory or an office again. Right. But that's not our world yet. Our economy is not yet in the metaverse. Uh, so if you have a great city where lots of people live, honestly, it doesn't matter if those people are citizens. It's still a great city in a very important sense. The um, migrants for the great cities of the Arab Gulf, Gulf states are, 
uh, those are a real part of their economy, even if you know they're not citizens, if they're just residents. The same is actually true of, say, illegal immigrants in the United States. They're part of the real economy, even when they're not really shown in any other metric. Um, by the way, there is an interesting and important way in which maybe agriculture is actually unprofitable and it's uh, being subsidized by every country everywhere in the world uh, simply as an indirect way to make industrialization viable at all. But that's like its own long discussion. <laughs> and um, this, by the way, if that's correct, then uh, illegal immigrants are actually sort of necessary for America's economic system to help do the farming cheaply. But again, these are these are slightly advanced provocations. Um, I think the first measure is, can they build, do they have large cities, like really truly metropolises? Second, can they build high technological products, either for military use or a civilian application? Third, what, how large are their largest companies? So companies in the sense of firms, right? A firm is, is an interesting unit of economic organization, yep. right? Do they have a great aerospace company? Do they have uh, any software giants? Do they have a car manufacturer? And so on. And once you start ticking off these concrete capabilities, uh, you realize that the exact size of the economy matters less than, do you have a city that attracts the elites of the world? Do you have the capability to build any crucial part of defense infrastructure that you need? Do you have some truly unique companies that are competitive in a global market? If the answer is yes to all three, then you have a remarkable economy and a fairly strong state, even if it's very small. And I can give an interesting example here. Israel has no great world city worth the name, but Tel Aviv is fun enough that people show up and go visit there. And Israel has some unique advantages that causes it to be better connected than other countries of its size. Uh, its technology sector is unrivaled. So of course, I actually think that GDP doesn't just undercount uh, countries and economies like Russia. I think it undercounts countries and economies like Israel's. Fascinating. Yeah, you're right. As, as, as you're saying it, I'm thinking, no, those are all things that you would want to look for in, in, in a country to assess its power. Are there any other surprising countries, like one that wouldn't make a person's top 10, but actually would make yours? Well, um, the, I did I did skip one criteria again that of energy right if you can be an energy supplier you are in a strong position uh, but for the top 10 list in the world I mean people are plenty surprised when I point out that Turkey is a strong regional power um, but if we wanted to go for a really surprising one you know I think if Indonesia is not on the top 10 it will be in the near future first off it's remained actually militarily unified, right? So they've had literal secessionist movements and terrorist problems, which means that the fact that they've resolved them, both politically and otherwise, means that they have fairly competent state security services. This means that they're not just going to simply fold uh, you know, to Chinese economic in interests and become some sort of new colony of China. I think they're actually going to be extremely motivated over the next 40 to 50 years to maintain independence versus China. And often being against something is a very powerful way in politics to do to do something else. Would Estonia and Taiwan be as well governed as each of them are were it not for the giant next door? That's an interesting question. Yeah. But does Indonesia have a great space company or a, a software giant or a car manufacturer? Not yet, but not they yet. are rich in minerals. They're rich, uh, you know, there's some, depending on how exactly the geological surveys pan out, they might be rich in energy and they have a greatly increasing population and they will in fact have more than one truly globally relevant city within the next 30 years. The rates of urbanization are very high. Do you think it'll be Jakarta? Perhaps, perhaps. Inter interesting. Or, or they will, uh, or some other city will race past it. Let's remember, this is a corner of the world where a city can develop rapidly. Singapore itself is, of course, not an Indonesian city, but it is a city in the region. Much of the world's trade passes through that part of the world. It is easy, therefore, to integrate itself into global supply chains. 
even as those supply chains weaken and are to some extent replaced by more regional economies, they're still absolutely massive. And the Indian Ocean, for example, if we think of the world's oceans, you think of trade over the Atlantic, trade over the Pacific. Both of these are kind of maxed out. 10 years from now, there won't be two times as much trade going over the Atlantic Ocean as there is today. 20 years from now, there will not be twice as much trade going across the Pacific as there is now. Maybe there'll even be less trade because China and the US will trade less. But the Indian Ocean, I guarantee you 50 years from now, there'll be more than five times as much trade going across the Indian Ocean. So the future of globalization is in the Indian Ocean insofar as globalization still has some energy left in it. I wanted to ask you your opinion about some of the governing bodies that are on trial as a result of, of these conflicts, specifically the UN and NATO. Uh, do you think that the UN serves any useful function at all? Do, do you think this that there's any point in having it around? I think there is. Uh, the crucial thing is the United Nations, if you think of it as a governing body, seems pretty ineffectual. But if you think of it as a legal framework that people must at least pay lip service to, it actually has some positives. There are a whole number of treaties that essentially all countries on earth have agreed to. So while they can violate the rules, they have to rules lawyer, they have to argue that they're in fact not violating the rules, uh, and they have to pretend or outright lie. And this cost might seem a small one, but it's the first step away from sort of pure anarchy. It sets international standards of behavior. It really does. There are, uh, you know, UN efforts or UN adjacent efforts that have been very successful, right? Um, and finally, I think there is a symbolic value to the very building. The United Nations building in New York is sort of the world's only shilling point for uh, where the planet is supposed to meet to discuss something. So the very existence of that place is notable and important because were it not for the United Nations, that place could only be the capital of the most powerful regional bloc. Interesting. So possibly that might be a, a monument that the globally minded would rally around. I honestly think that the UN building in New York might outlast the United Nations, the organization and would almost certainly keep its current function to a significant extent. Should they put the clock of the long now there? I mean, maybe, <laughs> or maybe they should should have some unique project there. I, I really think that there is an opportunity to make that particular place uh, something that just gains in reverence over hundreds of years. Can you imagine people visiting the museum in the United Nations the way people visit the Vatican? Like that could be done That's really fascinating. over the coming centuries, yeah. And then do you think that there is strategic value in the United States remaining in NATO, it being an organization that was established primarily to resist the predations of the Soviet Union, which then collapsed in 91? I suppose with the expansion of what do you call it, the unified state? The Union State. The, union uh, the state? official title is the Belarus Russian Union State. They've not gone for any smarter titles. <laughs> Uh, for a while, they were pursuing this thing called the Eurasian Economic Union, but that sort of never quite worked, though it still is the one entity that contains Kazakhstan, Russia, and Belarus. Uh, Belarus. Um, but I think, yeah, the Union state will probably be expanded as an object. To answer your question on NATO, though, um, I think NATO is currently still squarely in America's interest. Like I said, NATO countries are designed to fight as a team. Who is the most important team member? It's the United States. Therefore, the United States is, beside maybe France, the only NATO member that can act independently. There's no downside. What is the possible downside? Okay, maybe the risk of World War III if you literally accept Ukraine into it and <laughs> right. Russia invades Ukraine. Which but is not small. Look, it's, it's not a small risk, but honestly, Russia's not going to invade Poland. That's not going to happen. It's too weak. It's too weak, actually. That would overextend Russia. That would result in a conventional military defeat. Um, so I do think NATO's growth should be slowed. Perhaps one should reconsider the role of Turkey in NATO. But for the most part, uh, the United States continues to have a strong interest in, in uh, maintaining the NATO alliance. Well, I, I love it. I've wanted to interview you for a long time. We finally got it set up. Do you have any final thoughts you want to leave with the audience? I think it's 
more important than ever to consider which things change, but which things remain the same in politics with the advance of technology. Both are fallacies, right? The assumption that everything is different because our technology is different. Look, if 2022 and 2021 and 2020 have disproved anything, it is the idea that certain things just don't happen anymore. We still have global plagues, we still have wars, we still have territorial expansion, and yes, the government sometimes lies to you. <laughs> On the other hand, we need to understand that some games are fundamentally changed by advances in technology. The most concrete physical proof of this is progress in energy technologies, right? The changing value of different energy resources. The less tangible but still obvious example of this is the information revolution, where we've scaled our ability to talk as societies, where currently a shocking number of Western audiences were talking to each other about the invasion in Ukraine. Uh, it is an illusion to think the whole planet is talking with us. Let's be honest, when we talk about the international community, what we really mean is the United States, Europe, and Japan, okay? Uh, <laughs> right. You know, that's, that's kind of our world. But the fact that those countries can speak on basically the same platforms, normal citizens interacting with each other, that's crazy. That's unprecedented, right? That's truly a vast scale. And, um, you know, in an important way right now, if you're European, uh, you're sort of participating in America's discourse. Your, your national discourse is slowly eroded away and integrated into the American discourse, which sometimes is very healthy, other times is very unhealthy. It's kind of bizarre that people in Europe have opinions, whether they like blue states or red states, but they do. <laughs> uh, you know, I think that's going to eventually happen to the Japan as well. So really, that's a case where technology is driving culture. Fantastic, Samo. Thanks so much. Yeah, a pleasure, a pleasure talking to you.